What's up guys? Welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Rodell, and today we will be going over a game by Josh Waitzkin, who was a young American prodigy in the 1980s. In this game, Josh was only 10 years old, and it was actually the first game he ever beat a master. It's not just memorable because of the age at which he did it, but also how he did it. Josh Waitzkin was with the white pieces, and national master Edward Frumpkin was with the black pieces. So let's just hop right in. E4. C5. Knight F3. E6. D4. C takes D4. Knight takes D4. Knight F6. This is all very standard for the Sicilian defense. Knight C3. Knight C6. Bishop E3. And the aggressive move, Bishop B4. This actually puts pressure on the pawn on E4. So Waitzkin was forced to play F3, which is a natural move anyways. And here, D5. Here Josh creates a third of his own with the move Bishop B5. Putting pressure on this knight on c6. Frumpkin with the black pieces was forced to play bishop d7. Here we see bishop takes c6 and b takes c6. Here Josh plays e5. And after knight g8, we see that white's actually creating a space advantage. Knight h5 doesn't work because of g4. Trapping the knight. And a move like queen h4 doesn't work because of bishop f2, right? So after e5, knight g8 was forced. And here Josh plays a3. Now I think the best line for black here is to play bishop takes c3 check. He didn't play this, and Frumpkin was probably worried about his dark squares being weak, but I think black's okay here. Because after b takes c3, black has c5. And after knight b3, c4. Knight c5. And bishop c6. And I think black has a, ni a nice position here. The, it's roughly equal, but black can play moves like knight e7, followed by knight f5, queen a5, rook b8. Black has room to breathe here, right? However, after a3, instead of taking the knight, Frump can play bishop a5, which allowed Josh to play b4, kicking the bishop back to c7. And we have f4. And 97. And let's just look at this position for a second. Black is extremely cramped. All of his pieces are on the back two rows, the 7th and 8th rank. And there's not much room for activity here with the black pieces. On the other hand, white has a nice position. A nice knight on d4, nice knight on c3, the bishop's doing well. This queen has ideas of coming to g4. Development is very easy. And here, Josh tried to find a way to better his position. And he realized that there was a hole on c5. So Josh plays knight a4. This square on c5 is a hole because there's no pawn that can attack it. For the rest of this game, there's going to be no pawn that can attack the c5 square, right? So after castles, we see knight c5. And here, a5 from Frumpkin. Here Frumpkin is trying to create some counterplay. For example, after the move castles, black could play a takes b4 and a takes b4. And black's position is still not very great. But he is starting to create some activity for his pieces. But after a5, Josh didn't play move like castles. Josh played c3. The idea here is that after a takes b4, Josh could play c takes b4. And there's really not much stopping white from playing a4, a5, and a6. Right? And that pawn on a6 would be extremely strong. And this is just a very uncomfortable position for black. So after c3, here Frumpkin sees a nice hole, right? A square that cannot be attacked by any pawn on c4. So he starts to maneuver his knight. Idea being knight c8, knight b6, and knight c4, right? So he starts with knight c8. This is a nice idea by Frumpkin, trying to improve the position of his pieces. But as we see, it just gives Josh too much time to launch a kingside attack. Here Josh plays castles. Just a nice developing move, bettering the position. Knight b6. And here queen g4. This queen is hunkering down on the g7 pawn. Knight c4. Attacking this bishop on e3. So Josh has to play bishop f2. And here after queen e8, we see the nice move, rook fe1. The idea here is that you never know. 
when a move like f6 can come or f5, and, and you never know when things are going to break open. And it's always nice to have a rook aim towards a king or queen, right? Here Frump can play as bishop c8. And I've showed people this position before, and a lot of them say that Frump can play too passively here. But if you look at this position, there's really not much black can do. Again, his pieces are cramped, and black's just kind of moving around at this point. So after bishop c8, we see bishop h4, right? Now the threat here, let's just say a takes b4 is played, the threat is bishop f6. And after a move like g6, queen g5, queen h6, and queen g7, there's not anything that black can do here to stop it, and white's going to win this game. So after bishop h4, black plays king h8, right? The idea being, obviously, that now after bishop f6, the pawn can just take the bishop, right? So after king h8, and this really shows the maturity and the high level of play that Josh was able to play at just at the age of 10 with the move a4. He saw that his position was slightly better with the pawn on a4 than on a3. And he realizes that black does not have any time. White has space and white has time. So he just takes his time and improves his position. Here we see bishop e6 and rook ad1. Now when I first saw this game, I was worried that black could take the knight on c5, which is what Frumpkin did. And after b takes c5, we see that white pawns are very weak. The pawn on c5, pawn on c3 are double isolated, and the pawn on a4 is isolated. But here Josh realizes that he has five attacking pieces all coming for this king on h8. Here Frumpkin plays knight b2, attacking this rook on d1. Now a player like me, or really most people, would just immediately play rook a1, right? Because after knight b2, we see that the pawn on a4 and the rook on d1 are both attacked. So why not just append both with rook a1, right? But after knight b2, Josh doesn't do that. He plays rook e3, a rook lift, aggressively going for the king on h8. Here the best move for black was actually rook g8, but instead Frumpkin took the rook on d1, which was a mistake. So Josh just gave up a rook, and here in this position there is a move Josh played that basically ends the game. If you want, you can take a second and try to see if you can find the move. Josh played queen takes g7 check. And after king takes g7, bishop f6 check, we see that the black king is actually in a mating net. For example, after king g8, well, rook g3 is checkmate, right? The other two options are king g6 or king h6. If king h6, we have rook h3 check, king g6, and rook g3 check, which is the same position that was reached in the game. After bishop f6 check, king g6, and rook g3 check. So it leads to the same position. Now here Frump can play king h6, but let's just look at king h5 real quick to see what would have happened. After king h5, we have rook g5 check. And if king h6, bishop g7 is checkmate, right? If king h4, knight f3 is checkmate, right? So obviously king h5 leads to a loss. So here Frump can play king h6, which leads to a simple main 3. After bishop g7 check, king h5, rook g5 check, king h4, and knight f3, which is checkmate. I hope you guys enjoyed this game. This is probably one of my favorite games of all time. I'm still just amazed at how Josh Waiskin was able to slowly build up an attack. And Queen takes e7 check was a beautiful sacrifice. And to do this at such a young age is impressive. Josh in this game teaches us an important lesson, which is patience. Look guys, in chess, you have to pick your punches. You have to decide when to build up an attack and also when to strike. As a general rule of thumb, if your opponent is extremely cramped and can't do much, keep building, keep improving the position, have patience, and you'll reap the benefits of that. Thanks for watching today's video. If you'd like to watch another one, you can click or tap up here. And I've got a lot more high quality chess content on the way. So if you'd like to subscribe, you can click or tap down here. I really appreciate your support.